Bismillah, walhamdulillah, wa sallallahu ala rasulillah. Uh, Insha'Allah, today we're going to continue and complete our lecture on the famous scholar of the Sunni creed. His name was Abu Hassan al al Ash'ari. When we speak of the Sunnis today, nowadays, that we follow one of the four schools of fiqh, of Islamic law. The first of those scholars is Abu Hanifa. After Abu Hanifa was Malik. Imam Malik. And, it, and Imam Malik taught Shafi. Shafi. And Imam Shafi was among the teachers of Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So these are the four schools pertaining to what? Uh, going and elaborating on the details of the uh, Islamic jurisprudence, the science of like how to arrive at judgments from the sources of the Quran, from the Sunnah, from the Qiyas. So those are the scholars of uh, jurisprudence. Now when we speak of Ahl Sunnah and those scholars who went into the details pertaining to the Islamic creed, and clarifying and refuting, or let's say clarifying the difference between the Sunni creed and the belief of various deviant groups. And you, when using the proofs from the Quran, using proofs from the sayings of the Prophet وسلم, the proofs from the earliest generations of the Muslims of this nation, as well as the proofs from the Aql, the rational proofs. And there are two uh, pro the primary scholars in this field. Who were they? The meaning that the Sunnis follow. They weren't the first, but the meaning when we say Ahl Sunnah, we are following one of these two schools. Who was? Who are they? Al Ashari and the other. Al Maturidi. Now, in terms of the difference. The core is the same belief. The belief is what? The same. There's only one belief, the true belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? But they, like in certain cases, how they elaborated on the details, some of the terminology was different. And, and some finer points, there were some differences. But in general, the, the belief is the same. There's one creator who has no beginning, who has no end, who is the creator of everything, who does not need or resemble anything. Is that clear? Yeah, so the belief is what? One belief, okay? But somehow the different terminology they use. Now, how did these two schools come about? Because of differences in, in, in summary, differences in geography. We said that al Maturidi he was from what is today Uzbekistan region. And al Ash'ari, he was born in what? al Iraq. Iraq. He was born in Al-Iraq, and he was born in Basra and lived most uh, a good deal of his life, and he died in Baghdad. And he died in the year 323 uh, on the Western calendar, I believe. Now, Al-Ash'ari, he's very important because Baghdad at that time was the capital of the Muslim world, and it was the capital of knowledge in the world. So he, there were lots of different groups that were there. Lots of different ideas were floating around in the city of Baghdad. So there were deviant factions. So what did Al-Ash'ari do and also al maturidi They systematized how to refute the different deviant groups, okay, different deviant ideas. So they gave a system, like when you come here and you learn the creed, isn't it like a formula? We say this, this, and this. If someone says that, then you tell them this. If they say this, you tell them that. Did you yourself go through all of the Qur'an and then go through all of the, the sayings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? No. Just like when you learn, want to learn how to pray. Do you go to the Qur'an and do you go to the Hadith? Do you want the, the prayer, the invalidators of the prayer, the uh, preconditions of the prayer? Did you do all of that on your own? No. What did the scholars, here we follow the Shafi'i school, they systematize, okay, this is what you need to do to pray. This is what the prayer consists of. These are the things you need to do before you can pray. These are the things that invalidate, for example, your wudu. These are the things that invalidate your, the prayer itself. So they systematize. And the same when we talk about the belief, 
<laughs> These scholars put it in a very easy system so that we can, what, explain it. Is that clear? Okay. So, we mentioned that Al-Ash'ari, he was under the influence of a deviant sect. Now, he did not believe in all of their bad beliefs, but he was under their influence. What sect was that? I hear a pin drop, maybe. Not figuratively speaking. The Mu'tazila sect. Okay, let's mention their very, very bad belief that they had. And their belief is blasphemy. This was among their blasphemous beliefs. Our belief as Muslims is that Allah Ta'ala is the Rabb. He's the owner, the Lord of everything. And He doesn't owe us anything. Allah is the owner of everything and doesn't owe us anything. anything. Then we talk in our last lesson, we talked about our ability to see, yes. our ability to hear. We did not give ourselves these attributes. These are gifts. Allah Ta'ala, ni'mah. This is a ni'mah to see, to hear. This is a ni'mah. These are ni'mah from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah doesn't owe us anything. Aren't there some people who are born blind? Some become blind. Some people are born deaf. Some become deaf. Allah Ta'ala is not taking anything away from these people that they deserve. Allah Ta'ala is our owner and He does with us whatever He wills. Is this clear? Because our religion is based on submission. We submit to the Creator. Don't we say that He is Abdul so-and-so? Abdul Khaliq, Abdullah, Abdul Razza, meaning He is the slave of the Creator. <coughs> we don't call, so we call ourselves what? Slaves of God. We don't refer to ourselves as the offspring, the children of God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have family members. Allah does not have a lineage. Allah does not have descendants because the Creator does not resemble the creations. Okay? Lam yalid wa lam yulid. So this sect that Al-Ash'ari was originally influenced by, what was, it, what was the name of that sect? Come on, guys. The Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila. Good. Very good. The Mu'tazila. So this sect they were not Muslims. <coughs> they claimed to be Muslims, but they were not, not Muslims. Not. Okay, we need to be clear because some people, they start to play with language. They did not believe as Muslims believe. In our first lesson today, we said Allah is one, and among the meanings is Allah is the one and only creator. No one is the creator except Allah. The Mu'tazila, this bad sect, they claimed that... Allah is not the only creator. So if someone says Allah is not the only <coughs> creator, we have to say that person is not a Muslim. He's a mushrik because he believes that he doesn't believe in one God. Because when we say God, we mean God the creator. No one is the creator except Allah. So among their bad beliefs, they said Allah Ta'ala is not the creator of everything. And also they had a bad, another bad belief of theirs. They said Allah must do what is best for for the people. And this is also blasphemy. Allah doesn't owe us anything. Allah doesn't owe us anything. He's not obligated. Allah is not obligated with anything. Okay? So, they keep this in mind. Now let's mention a basic proof. We won't mention the proof that Al-Ash'ari mentioned when he, remember the debate? When he asked the guy, what was his name? The J guy? Al-Jubai. Al Al-Jubai. Very good. When he debated Al-Jubai. So we won't go through that issue. Where it was, there was the case of what the the boy, and there was the righteous Muslim man, and then there was the disbeliever. Okay, we'll mention a summary. What is a basic proof that to show that Allah Taala does is not obligated to do what is best for us? How do you refute that? Basic rational proof. Basic rational proof. You know? Did you hear this before? Okay, go ahead. If Allah did what was best for us... It was obligated. Say, if Allah were obligated, according to what these people are claiming. If that were so, then go ahead. If that were so, then um, we would all be in paradise. MashaAllah. Very good. See, these people, they, the, the, the Mu'tazila, they employed logic. Okay? But they started from false premises. From a false assumption. They started from the assumption that... God is what? Obligated to do what is best for us. And then they, from that bad belief, they use logic and reason
to try to demonstrate that bad belief. But what do we say? <coughs> Allah, which is the truth. Allah doesn't owe us anything. That's the beginning point for us. And then from there, we can use, we can use Quran, we can use Hadith, but we can also use what? Logic and reason. And one of the proofs that Allah Ta'ala is not obligated to do what is best for us is that it would be better for us to be where? In paradise. Are we in paradise? No. So it's very clear that Allah Ta'ala is not obligated to do what is best for us. Because it's contrary. Not only is it irrational, meaning to claim that Allah owes, is obligated to do what is best for us, it's even contrary to our what? experiences. Okay? So the Mu'tazila, what happened with Al Ash'ari, radiallahu anhu, is that he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a dream. And the Prophet وسلم, told him to abandon the school of the Mu'tazili, the Mu'tazila, and to refute them. And that's what he did. But he also addressed other types of deviant groups that were spread at that time. And Al uh, Al Ash'ari, his school became famous. And let's mention something here that why do the Sunnis follow the Maturidi school or the Ash'ari school? Because their method of explaining the belief was so thorough that the scholars who came after them, they what? They followed their methodology. Okay? So that, this is why the, they, the Sunnis, the scholars, and, and we as common people following the, the scholars, that we follow their methodology of al-Ash'ari or al-Maturidi. Now, many of the Sunnis, uh, the later Sunni scholars, they were followers of al-Ash'ari. Among the most famous and, and greatest of the Sunni scholars was Abu Bakr ibn al-Baqilani. <coughs> Al-Baqilani, he said, I will be in the best of levels of my knowledge if I can understand the words of Al-Ash'ari, meaning that his knowledge was so dense, okay? Because uh, they were dealing with like what the, the arguments of the Mu'tazila, and they were going deep into like philosophical arguments. So you have to study the arguments of your opponent so you can what? Break them down. If you don't know what your opponent says, how are you going to be effectively, how, how can you effectively debate against them? You won't know. You don't know what they believe. Now, certain things, you, you can hold on to the truth. You can speak the truth about the belief, but you won't be able to, uh, to debate them in the most effective way unless you understand what they say and why they say it. You know, okay, well, they say this, this, and this, and these are, this is the rationale. This is why they say what they say. So one of the accusations uh, against us, meaning the, the real Sunnis, that come from the body worshiping sect known as the uh, the Wahhabis. What is one of their accusations against us, Brother Ahmed Ibrahim? They say that we believe Allah has everywhere. Okay, that's a specific one. I was looking regarding this issue of what is the source of our methodology. They accuse uh -huh. us of being involved in. They say we're involved in philosophy. They say that we're involved in philosophy. This is not true. This is not true. We, the, we meaning the, our scholars, and we're following them, and we're using their arguments, so I say we here, that they studied the philosophers so they could what? Refute them. Is that clear? And our belief is not based in philosophy. Our belief is based in what? Quran and in the Sunnah. And we say that there's nothing in the teachings of the Qur'an and Sunnah, in particular we're talking about the creed, the belief in God. There's nothing in it that what contradicts itself. You see this? Or it contradicts just the general judgment of reason. What is our belief? That there's one God, that there is one Creator. That the Creator existed before the creations. That the Creator doesn't need any of the creations. The belief that there's one God, is this mentioned in the Qur'an? Yes. Yes. The belief that Allah is the only creator, is this mentioned in the Qur'an? Yes. The belief that Allah has no beginning or end, is this mentioned in the Qur'an? Yes. The belief that Allah doesn't need or resemble the creations, is this mentioned in the Qur'an? Yes. So this is not something that we just came up with an idea. Remember what did the Mu'tazila do? They said that God has to do what is best for us. 
Where did they get that from? That's just something they came up with in their mind. Okay? When, when we mention our belief, it is from the Qur'an. But at the same time, our belief does not contradict the mind. You follow this, Brother Omar? To say that Allah is one. This is in the Qur'an. Allah has no beginning. This is in the Qur'an. Allah has no end. This is in the Qur'an. That Allah doesn't need or resemble the creations. All of this is in the what? It's in the Qur'an. But that, and, let's say, and that belief does not contradict the mind. You see? As for the Wahhabis, what is their situation? The so-called Salafis. They have a bad belief that starts from the premise, whether they use the Qur'an or they use their mind first, but they would say it's from the Qur'an. They believe that Allah Ta'ala, well, let's say it is from a premise, a faulty premise, that which is not in the Qur'an, that they say that you have to take all the verses of the Qur'an according to them, literally. Huh? So if they do that, then what happens? They run into what? Contradiction. They run into contradictions. Okay? They start from a premise which is not in the Qur'an. The Qur'an tells us that there are muhkam verses and mutashabihat verses. Okay? There are verses that are to be taken in their most literal apparent sense, and then there are verses that are not to be taken in their most literal apparent sense. The Wahhabis ignored the fact that there are mutashabihat verses, or let's say of the mutashabihat verses, some of them, they insist that you take those verses literally. Now when they take those verses literally, what happens? They contradict the, the let's say, well they contradict the Qur'an because they don't, they'll tell you they don't use the intellect. So they'll say that Allah Ta'ala is literally situated most high, in the highest location. But then at night they say He <coughs> descends to the lowest heaven. So the lowest heaven is way below the ceiling of paradise and what's above paradise, right? Yeah. So above paradise is one location, the, low, the first heaven is what? Another location. The, 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 the first heaven is far beneath what? The ceiling of paradise. Okay? So what are they saying? They're saying Allah is in the first heaven, but at the same time, which is beneath what? Al-Jannah. And beneath and among the lowest, the lowest of the seven heavens. They're saying he's beneath the arsh, beneath the heavens, or in the lowest heaven, but at the same time he's above the arsh. This is a what? Or they'll say that no, he's not above the arsh at that time. He's he's beneath it, but then at the same time they'll say he's above everything. Which is still the same. Do you follow me? So this is a contradiction. They're saying he's most high literally, but then he's beneath other things. This is a contradiction. And it also contradicts the judgment of the mind because we know rationally, it's mentioned in the Quran, it's mentioned by the Prophet وسلم, that Allah existed before the creations. In the last lesson, then we say Allah existed before there was, there was no up or down, right or left, front or back. Allah existed and there were no directions. There was no time, there was no place. So we know that since Allah existed before the creations, Allah Ta'ala is not in a direction this is our belief. Okay? It's, it is from the basis as the Qur'an, but it doesn't contradict the what? Intellect. For the Wahhabis who accuse us of, a, of philosophy, they say that because if you use your mind, what is a person going to see in the belief of the Wahhabis? He's going to see what? Is it going to be consistent? It's going to contain? Contradictions. Contradictions. So in order to avoid running into contradictions, they'll tell you, well, talking like that, meaning using rational proofs, or just following the line of what they claim. If you believe this, this, and this, well, it leads to this. They'll tell you, well, that's philosophy. Because they know in reality what they're saying is what? Absurd. Okay? So the, our use of the rational proofs is not philosophy. It is demonstrating that the truth does not contradict itself. How do you know something's true? Because it doesn't what? contradict itself. So they're saying, well, something can be true while at the same time it is contradictory. This shows you, because they know that their belief doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any sense. Okay, so let's go back. Let's go back. We mentioned about uh, Imam al-Baqalani, and he said that he, he's at his best when he can understand the talk of uh, Al-Ash'ari, because he was so brilliant. So, one, who was Al-Baqalani? There's a nice story about him 
رحمه الله تعالى. الباقلاني, like we said, he was one of the most prominent scholars of the followers of uh, Abu Hassan al Ashari. He is he was known as the judge. When you say the judge, who is it? Al Baqilani. Like if you don't say the judge so and so. This is to show what his fame and his reputation. So there was a case, an instant an instance, where he was sent to the king of the Romans. Okay? And he was to go there and talk to them about Islam. So the king knew that al Baqalani, this is to show you how sharp he was. The king knew that al Baqalani is coming to debate. So they know he's gonna, he has to come through the door. So some of you know the story. What did they do with the doorway? They, they made it, to make him they made it lower. Okay, so like the door, you know, just look at the door there. It's high, right? Maybe almost seven feet tall. They made the door low, so when you have to go in to, to the, into the, the, the room where the king is, the person would have to what? Bow down. Bow down, because they want that, because in their culture, they want people to bow down to their kings. Okay? So Al-Baqalani, as he's getting ready to go into the room, he looks, he sees this door is low like this. And he knows, oh, they want me to what? Bow, because he's not, he's a Muslim. Is he going to bow down to this guy? No. So they, they want me to bow down as I enter the room. So what did Al-Baqalani do? If you know what to say. Yes. He turned the other way around. He turned the other way around and he backed in. Do you get what happened? So he went in backwards. So his so-and-so went in first. This was done to what? To make fun of the, the of the king. Because this king is arrogant. He wants people to what? Bow down to him. So Al-Baqalani went in backwards. So that his backside went in first. Okay. So that was one thing. And also when he was there and he was talking with their people, their, their clergy. Do you know what I mean by clergy? Their priest. So he said to them, he said, well, how, how's the wife doing and how are the kids? And they were like, like, this guy is supposed to be like your scholar? And they said, don't you know that our, our priests are too holy to have wives and children? You see, because it, in, in the Christian tradition, originally, the priests were not allowed to get married. married. So they're saying, don't you know our, our priests, they're too holy. They're too high. They have too great a status to have wives and children. And then what did al Baqalani say? So they said that to him. And then what did al Baqalani say? He said, he said you, attribute the, you, you don't attribute this to your clergy, but you attribute it to the Creator. You see this, Yahya? That they, they say that God has children. They say that God had a child with Lady Mary. Yeah. They attribute having children and reproducing with a human being. They attribute it to their <laughs> priest. But, or they attribute it to the creator. But they say our priests are too good for that. You see? So this is Abakalani. He what? He silenced them. He silenced them. So, Imam, this was Al-Baqalani. Now, going back to Al-Ash'ari, he was not only was he very intelligent, not only did he have a lot of knowledge, not only did he have a very, very powerful memory, he was also strong in the worship. And we said before <coughs> that you see in the Islamic tradition that the, the scholars, they also, when you get into the knowledge, the person becomes more well-balanced. He becomes a more complete human being. When you look in the Western culture, and you look at the people that they regard as like they're intellectuals, what often is the case with these people? They're atheists. Well, they're atheists. What else about them? You guys see it even in school. The kids that they call the smart kids, a lot of them, what's their situation? They're, they're the N-word. I don't mean the word that you can't say on the radio anymore. Nerd. Oh, nerd. They're nerds, right? They often, not all the smart people, but a lot of them, they are what? They are weird. You understand? I'm not saying, no, it's good to be smart. Don't, don't get it mixed up. It is good to be smart. But many of those people that they regard as being intelligent, they are weird. They, they're like antisocial. They don't know how to deal with people. There's something, what? 
strange about them. And when you look at their intellectuals and their artists, like their famous writers and stuff like that, what is the case with a lot of those guys? They end up going what? Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. They go crazy. A lot of their philosophers and things like the people they consider like their intellectuals, a lot of them, they end up going crazy. All right? A lot of them. So with, with the Muslim scholars, you find as one gets deeper in the knowledge, he becomes more what? Complete. So Al-Ash'ari wasn't only phenomenally intelligent and knowledgeable, but he was also very strong in worship. And it was reported about him that for 20 years, he prayed the Isha, uh, he prayed the, the, the Subah, the Fajr time prayer, with the wudu of Isha. What does that mean? He didn't sleep. He didn't sleep during the night. Stayed up all night. What? Usually praying. The habit of the scholars, spending the nights up praying and studying and answering questions because people are going to be what? Sending them, what's the case of this? What's, how do I respond to this? So they would spend their nights in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would spend their nights in study and they would spend their nights in answering questions. Because during the day they're busy what? Teaching. So when do they have the time to be alone to worship Allah like, like for a long time? During the what? Night. During the night time. When the other people are doing what? They are sleeping. sleeping. These people, they either get up to pray or some of them they stay up all night to be involved in the worship. Imam Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anhu, he used to recite the entire Quran every night. Yeah, the entire, not, not, not just Amma. The whole Qur'an he would recite while he is praying. Every night he would recite the entire Qur'an. These people are amazing. They are amazing. Uh, also, in addition to his knowledge in Tawheed, uh, Al-Ash'ari was also very learned in the matters of fiqh. Fiqh meaning the what? The Islamic jurisprudence, Islamic law. And he was a follower of the Shafi'i school. Okay? And he was also a high-ranking scholar in the field of hadith. So he wasn't just a one-dimensional scholar who was strong in the area of Aqidah. He was strong in the area of fiqh. He was strong in the area of uh, hadith. And he was also a very, very, very strong worshiper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, this is our way that you will find that our scholars, many of them were not only scholars, they were also warriors. So you'd have somebody who has a phenomenal level of knowledge, and he's also a what? A warrior. This is Because Islam produces a what? A complete human being. Like you said, in this country, a lot of the people that they call like they're intellectuals, they, they tend to be weird, they tend to be weak. You find many of the scholars, mashallah, they, they were men among men, mashallah, okay. Uh, Abu Bakr ibn Furaq, who was a famous scholar, he counted more than a hundred books authored from by Imam uh, al-Ash'ari. And Imam al-Juwaini, the Imam of the Haramain, the, the two holy sanctuaries of Mecca and Medina, he said that there were more than 200 books uh, from al-Ash'ari, including an interpretation of the Qur'an, a commentary of the Qur'an, which was... 200 volumes. How many volumes? 200. 200. So, oh, that was the other thing. At night, they're also going to be up at night doing what? Writing, writing books. Yeah, that was, that was another practice of the scholars. So, Al-Ash'ari, when we talk about him, he is the imam, one of the imams of Ahl Sunnah, one of the leading imams of Ahl Sunnah in the creed. So we said there's Al-Ash'ari, and who was the other scholar of the creed? Al-Maturi. Okay, now let's talk in brief, where do these scholars, uh, where are they uh, dominant? Does anybody remember? The Ash'aris, where would you find the Ash'aris? Or if you say like, I want to know, well this guy, he's an Ash'ari. Well, if we say the Ash'aris, where would you find them? Where would you find them? Historically, till today. Who are the people who follow the Ash'ari school? What regions of the Muslim world? Let me put it that way. Is it the Arab, the, the Arab world? Mm, you said the where? The Arab world, like the 
Uh, yeah, that kind of works, but I'd rather do it by country. But that kind of works. So he said, okay, I'll go that way. The Arab countries, but not all of them. See, that's why. Like where? Asham, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, the people of that region, you'll find predominantly Ash'aris. Across North Africa, you're going to find Ash'aris. West Africa itself, Ash'aris. East Africa, Ash'aris. So you could say, in general, the Sunnis of Africa are the Ash'aris. Okay, in general. Now, there are some populations of the Indo-Pakistani community. That's a little bit different. But in general, the Muslims of Africa are Ash'aris. The people who follow the school of Imam Malik, they usually are Ash'aris. And the Ash'aris are usually found in Africa. I mean, the Malikis are usually found in North Africa and West Africa. West Africa. Also, I know in Sudan also. Okay. Now, the people of East Africa, in terms of madhab, of fiqh, what, what do they follow? They follow the Shafi'i school. So North Africa, West Africa, they follow the, in fiqh, in, in Islamic law, they follow Maliki. the Maliki school. East Africa, the Shafi'i school. So like Tanzania, uh, the Swahili coast, that region, the Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, those people follow the Shafi'i school. Also Egypt, okay? Where else do you find the Shafi'is and the, and the Ash'aris? Where else would you find them in the Muslim world? Iraq. Where else? Turkey. Not so much. To the far east lands of the Muslim world. China. No. Indonesia. Indonesia, that part there. Yeah. Indonesia, Malaysia. what else? Malaysia, Singapore, the Philippines. Oh, yeah. The people in that region are also Ash'aris. Also the people of Yemen. Okay? The Sunnis of Yemen. Uh, and where would you find the Maturidis? Turkey. Usually they are with the Hanafi school. They're Hanafi and Fiqh, and then they'll be what? Maturidi in the, the details of the Aqidah, theology. Brother Yahya said what? Turkey. Turkey. And the places the Turks used to rule. The Turks used to rule East Euro Eastern Europe. So the Muslims there, they tend to be, the ones who observe it, they tend to be Maturidi. The stands. What do we mean by the stands? Pakistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kurdistan. Well, yeah, yeah, they are Kurdistan. Those people they tend to be also Maturidis, and also China. The Muslims of China, like Western China, the Uyghur people that they are also Maturini. We're talking about people who are observant, because a lot of places, the people under the communist rule, a lot of people are very, because of them, they're very ignorant of the religion. Because a lot of the Muslims, whether from the Soviets or from the Chinese, a lot of the Muslims were put under a great deal of oppression. And a lot of the scholars were imprisoned, a lot of people were killed during the rule of these uh, communists. And you know, even until today, what's the case with the Uyghurs, the Uyghur people? They are what? Being oppressed by the, the Chinese government. Okay, so that is in a nutshell where these schools are. And we said that the, the reason that you have these two schools is basically because of differences in, in geography. Now there's more to it because you had like rulers, they would adopt a certain school and then that would become the dominant school of the region. But just geographically you find that these two schools tend to be in two different areas. Okay, let's mention some of the scholars who are either Maturidi or, uh, or, or uh, Ashari in their school. And it's important to mention this. Why? Why is this important to mention? Because we mentioned before our opponents, those guys who call themselves Salafis. In reality, they are, what do we call them, really? Wahhabis. They are claiming to be Ahlul Sunnah. We know that a person who believes that God is an object is not a Sunni. By an object meaning something with size and dimensions. Because Wahhabis believe that, even if they don't use those words. <coughs> that those people who believe this about God, meaning the Wahhabis, that God, they claim God has size and dimensions, they are not Sunni, and in reality they are not even Muslims. 
Because a person who, if a person worships a cow and he called himself a Muslim, we would still we would say he's not a Muslim. A person says he's a, a Muslim and he believes that, that he himself is God, we would say he's not a Muslim. So as the one who believes God is a body on earth, likewise the one who believes that God is a body or something with size and shape uh, above the earth, either case, this person would not be in reality a Muslim. Now, the Wahhabis themselves, when did their movement get started, approximately? When did their movement get started? 250 years ago. About 250 years ago. Because they're from, what, the region of Najd, okay? Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab was active in the 18th century, in the 1700s. These people have no isnad back to the Salaf and to the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What do we mean by isnad? Uh, it is a, 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 a chain of learning. We're not talking about a, a, a blood lineage, but a what scholarly lineage. That when you learn, you learn from so and so who learned 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 from so and so back to the Prophet. As for the Wahhabis, they came, they started what, 250 years ago. And what did they say? They said that the people call themselves Muslims, they aren't Muslim in reality. We are the only ones who are Muslim. So, if they're the only ones who are Muslim, according to them, according to them, and their movement started 250 years ago, then where would their chain to the Prophet be? Doesn't exist. Okay? And so, so they claim that they are the real Sunnis. So, for them to even have any type of legitimacy, even in their minds, they would have to follow scholars who came before them. They have to reference them. Maybe not follow them, but they have to reference the people who came before them because there's what? They're from the 1700s and the Prophet وسلم, passed away in the 600s. There's a, more than a thousand years between the time of the Prophet and the time of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. Okay? A thousand years. Not a hundred years, but a thousand. So they, you find the Wahhabis quoting the very scholars who themselves were Ash'aris, or Maturidis. Among them is Abu Ishaq al Isfarayini, who was known as Al Ustad, meaning the one, the skilled one, the skillful one. And Abu, who we just mentioned, Abu Ar, <coughs> he's very famous for, from the school of Al Ashari. Also, Abu Nu'aym al Asbahani. You know, in the Ibn Al Sakr, at the end, there is that report about Imam Ali and that group of Jewish people come to him. Remember this? And they ask them, they ask Imam Ali some invalid questions about Allah. That is from the book of Abu uh, Nu'aym al hayya which is the book about like the biographies of the early righteous Muslims. <coughs> also, we mentioned Abu Muhammad al Juwaini and his son, uh, Imam Abu Ma'adi al Juwaini, the Imam of the Haramain. These are also two famous Ashari scholars. Also, Abu Mansur at Tamimi, he's the author of Al Farqul Bain Al Firaq. The scholars they wrote books about the different uh, deviant factions. They mentioned the right belief, and then they wrote about the deviant factions. Why would they do that? So that you can know right from wrong. wrong. You can know. Oh, oh, those that that group. Oh, they say this, this, and this. What do we say to them? This is what we say. How to refute these different groups? Also, Al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, who wrote a famous book called the Tariq, the history of Baghdad. Also, Abu Qasim al-Qushayri, and also Abu Nasr al-Qushayri, they were very famous scholars. And, and Abu Qasim al-Qushayri, he wrote the Risala, like the, 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 the letters about Tasawwuf. And what is Tasawwuf? The science of purifying the heart what is called in English Sufism. Now are there some crazy Sufi got cla people claim to be Sufis and they do some crazy stuff? Yeah. But the science, the science of Tasawwuf is a legitimate science in Islam. Also there is Imam Al-Ghazali. Who was Imam Al-Ghazali? What was his situation? Brother Ahmed Ibrahim. <laughs> He refuted. He refuted the philosophers. He refuted the philosophers. He is very famous. He, he was a scholar in, in Baghdad. 
And then he had a spiritual crisis. What happened? His tongue froze. What do we mean by that? He wasn't able to talk. talk. Why was that? It's a spiritual malady, meaning it's something wrong in the heart. He was brilliant. He was a genius. A lot of these people, they were geniuses. Don't you hear about geniuses? But these were not geniuses like these weird people. These were geniuses who were obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He would be giving the lectures, and then he start, when he's starting to examine himself, and he's looking at his niya. What's the niya? Intention. The intention, the motivation. Why am I really giving this lesson? And he came to the realization that he's worried about his intention. Is he giving the lesson only for the sake of Allah? Or is he looking for the praise from the people? So what happened, he had the highest position. Like maybe somebody now is the leading lecturer at Harvard, for example, in, I don't know, business, at the Harvard Business School, for example. And then one day he just, what? Quits. Usually somebody, the Ahl dunya person, is he going to quit that position? No. He didn't just quit that position. He left, like, following things in the dunya. And he became, lived a life of, of aestheticism, the zuhud lifestyle. And he did that for about a decade, maybe about 12 years. He would just live a very simple, humble life. You know what he used to do? He would be the one who would clean the toilets at the mosque. And he would do it in incognito. You know what incognito means? Should not be seen. Without people knowing who he was. So here this guy, man was one of the greatest scholars of his era. He's living a very simple, humble life. And what's he doing at the mosque? He's cleaning the what? And the toilets in the old days are not like our French toilets with water in them. Who's been to the old countries and seen those toilets? Yeah. So here, the, the, one of the greatest scholars who had one of the highest positions in the whole Islamic world, the scholarly positions, he's now doing what? Cleaning the toilets. toilets. In one occasion, some people were discussing a religious case. And they just see this guy, they're looking at him just, he's a guy. Comes to the mosque, does his thing. And they were discussing a religious case, and somebody made a mistake. So he corrected them. And then they realized this must be al Ghazali, Because back then you didn't have Facebook, you didn't have what photo ID, right? They realized who would know the answer to this question? It had to be somebody with a lot of what? No. knowledge. And when they found out who he was, what did he do? He left. Because he didn't want the people to know his identity. His identity. Why? Because he wants to spend his time with real sincerity worshipping Allah Ta'ala. You see this? With real sincerity. A lot of times a person will get knowledge. And then what happens? He gets what? Look at me. I, I'm the scholar. He gets what? Arrogant. Arrogant. And then he starts doing the, the good deeds but with the wrong intention. intention. Okay. So Al-Ghazali after he spent oh, about a decade just living a very, very humble life, he sees that the religion is under attack. And what's one of the rules in the religion? To order the good and to forbid the evil. Yeah. And he knows about himself, not out of arrogance, he knows about himself that he's qualified to deal with these different issues. People confuse, you have people like we mentioned about Sufis, right? There are people who claim to be Sufis, but they were misguided. Then there are other people saying that Sufism shouldn't exist at all. Okay? So there are other people, as you mentioned, about the philosophers and other things. There were different stages of his life. But just in general, there, were a lot, there was lots of controversy. So what he did is he went back to his teaching post after spending those years, what, doing what with himself? Praying. Praying and working on his heart. And then he, he took the position. <laughs> and then he clarified a lot of the confusion that existed at that time. Do you see this? So this is the way. So he was among the great scholars of the Ash'ari school. And his brother Ahmed said he was one of the, the scholars who, he basically obliterated the, the fitna of the, of the philosophers. Because there were people at that time, they were confused, they were reading the books of Aristotle and Plato and some of the people claiming to follow Plato later. They, and, 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 he, and they were claiming to be Muslim. And he obliterated, he nailed, he destroyed them, he destroyed them. He started, didn't we say earlier, in order to refute somebody, you need to what? Understand what they can say. So he studied the books of philosophy in order to efficiently 
refute the philosophers. That is Imam al-Ghazali. Also, Imam Ahmed al-Rifai, you know, he was one of the great Sufis. What was, what was his famous karama? Yeah, fuqara. He's the one we'll mention it another time, inshallah. Inshallah. Also, Abu Qasim ibn Asakr. Who is Abu Qasim ibn Asakr? Don't we learn? Qala Shaykh Fakhruddin ibn Asakr. Did many of us learn that? So, this ibn Asakr that we memorize the Aqidah, who is he and who is Abu Qasim? You remember? Is the nephew of Abu Qasim ibn Asakr. Abu Qasim is the uncle of Fakhruddin ibn Asakr. They were both Ashari schools. And uh, uh, Fakhru, uh, Abu Qasim ibn Asakr, he wrote a famous history uh, on the city of Damascus. I saw it, maybe they have it printed. Maybe it's like 50 volumes. Yeah, this is the type of scholarship. And back then they didn't have, they weren't doing what? Typing. Typing. So whether he wrote it himself, a lot of times the scholars would also dictate the books. You follow? It doesn't mean they wrote all of them by their own hand, but they would what? They would dictate them. They would tell, they would, they would teach their, their, their students. Also among the great, uh, uh, the great Ash'ari schools, uh, scholars, uh, called the Iyad al-Maliki. He's the author of Ashifa. Ashifa's very famous book about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also Imam al nawawi Who is Imam al nawawi He wrote a very... Every Muslim practically has this book in their house. What book is that? Not the Qur'an. Of course Muslims have the Qur'an. The 40 Hadith of al nawawi Do you see if a Wahhabi is claiming like, well, they're on the truth, for them to follow even what they claim, who do they have to quote? They have to quote Anawi and other Ash'ari scholars. They have to go back to the Ash'ari scholars. Last night I was looking at this, uh, some st on this topic, and the somebody mentioned this. Well, you, fought, you mentioned Anawi, Aqadi, uh, uh, um, uh, and other scholars of Ahl Sunnah, the... the MashaAllah can. Al Asqalani, they mentioned. And they said, oh, oh, yeah, those are Ash'aris, but they, you know, we all make mistakes. Because they can't get to the Prophet unless they, meaning by Isnad, they have to go through the what? The Ash'aris or, and or the Maturidis. Because we are the people who have the Isnad to the Prophet. Imam Al Qurtabi, who is a very famous scholar of Quranic exegesis, <coughs> Quranic commentary. Also an Ash'ari. The, ju the judge, Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, also an Ash'ari. Taqiyuddin al-Subki, and Tajuddin al-Subki, also Ash'ari scholars. Also Taqiyuddin and Tajuddin, they're important because they wrote about it. Who was it? Ibn Taymiyyah. They lived at his time and they spoke about him. So, a multitude of scholars through the eras, through the decades, and through the centuries, they have been Ash'ari scholars. Let's mention a few of the rulers, a couple of them. Who was the ruler who liberated the city of Jerusalem from those crusaders? The crusaders were the European Christians who came and they invaded the, the Middle East, Asham region, and other places. Who was that ruler who liberated the city of Jerusalem from the Crusaders? Everybody should know. If I ask you who's the first president of the United States, everybody will what? Was it no. um, Erase it. <coughs> Salahuddin al Ayyubi. Okay? Salahuddin. Al Ayyubi. He was a Kurdish person. He wasn't an Arab, okay? But he was the ruler of the of the of that part of the Muslim world. Okay? He he was also he was a hero and he also was what method did he follow in Aqidah? The Ash'ari school. Okay? 
Salah al-Din, what he did, and he was very smart, because at that time there was fitna from the Crusaders and also from the so-called Fatimids. Who were the Fatimids? The extremist Shia sect. They claimed that God was a man. This is extreme, extreme, extreme Shi'i sect. Ismaili. Like we talked about in the lecture, we mentioned the assassins. Okay? They, they are connected. The, the Fatimids, so-called Fatimids, and the assassins, they were among the extreme, among the, the seviner Shi'i sect. So Salahuddin al-Ayyubi, what did he do? We said in our first lecture, lecture to lesson today, what makes the Muslim strong? To learn the what? The right belief. This is what gives us our what? Strength. To learn the right belief. To know really and understand the truth about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So al-Salahuddin, uh, al uh, he knew in order to get us united, to what? To, re to repel the crusaders <laughs> and to stop these, ext these extremists, extremist Shia, what, what, what did he do? Strengthen the Muslims, the Sunnis, on the what? The right belief. So he, what he did is he had a creed that was given to him by Ibn Hibba al-Makki, who was also himself a what? An Ashari scholar. That and do, after the Subah prayer, they would recite this creed from the minarets. So this is the way people communicated back then, okay? So the, and, and this creed mentions the creed of the, the Ahlul Sunnah. In that creed of Ibn Hibba al makki it mentions explicitly that Allah exists without being in a place, okay? So this was the creed to strengthen and unite the Muslims, teach the people the fact that the proper belief. Uh, Salahuddin al Ayyubi, in, even though he was a renowned warrior, he would teach. He would take the time out each day to teach his, his small children the right creed. So, although he was busy as a as a, a leader, as a frontline warrior, he also was involved in teaching his children. Also, among the people who followed our methodology, the real methodology of Ahl the Sunnah, he was from. He, now he was a Maturidi, Muhammad Al Fatih. He was a Hanafi and a Maturidi. The Prophet. What was Muhammad Al Fatih famous for? Al Fatih means the liberator, the opener. What was he famous for? He opened the city of Constantinople. The Prophet وسلم, said that the one who liberates the city of, of Constantinople will be a righteous person and his army will be a righteous army. And who opened it? Muhammad al Fatih. And what was he? He was a Maturidi. Okay, meaning like us, meaning Ashari Maturidi. So the Prophet وسلم, said 800 years before it happened that the city of, of Constantinople will be opened. And it will be opened, deliberated by a righteous man. And that righteous man was a Maturidi. He wasn't a Wahhabi. He wasn't following Ibn Taymiyyah. He was following Abu Hassan al-Ashari slash Abu, uh, Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. So this is our way. These are our people. And when you look throughout the history from generation to generation to generation, what do you find the vast majority of the people who are claimed to be Sunni, what are they following? either the Ash'ari school or the Maturidi school. And if somebody tries to tell you otherwise, like there's a character here in this city who's trying to confuse people, now you know otherwise. That Ahlul Sunnah, we follow this methodology of explaining the creed, clarifying the matter, matters of the creed, using the method of either Abu Hassan al-Ash'ari or Abu Mansur al-Maturidi. والحمد لله وصلى الله على رسول الله